Good morning, John. So as you can tell by the headphones, the different camera angle, the length of the video, we're doing something a little bit different today. I wanted to take an opportunity to talk to somebody who is a part of this community, watched her first Vlogbrothers video in 2007, and also is just a really amazing person who does a lot of amazing work doing advocacy and activism and strategy uh, and writing. Most recently, she was the campaign manager for Julian Castro. She's now working with Elizabeth Warren. I think we're really lucky to have her as part of this community, so I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk to Maya Rupert. Obviously, it's a hard time, so Maya, I guess I'll just start out by asking, um, how how are you feeling right now? This is a hard time. This has yeah. been, and this has been a very hard time, even as I, I, I feel like I have been someone I've worked in these spaces um, a lot. And I feel like I have a pretty high capacity for things are going badly, but you know, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and, and that kind of thing. These last couple of weeks have hit me really hard and I know they're hitting a lot of people really hard. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm hanging in, I'm taking a lot of solace in the fact that I know a lot of people are feeling this right now and are making community where they can and are being there for each other, which is always the thing that I can take solace in, in these moments, because that kind of, that, gives me hope that there that there mm -hmm. is somewhere we're trying to go with this but i mean this is a tough time and this this one really does feel different from you know the perspective inside of uh you know presidential politics at this point which is is uh you know a, a world of its own i'm sure um uh, can, can you give me sort of like a little bit of a feeling for what it looks like from that perspective? A lot of leaders right now are, are looking to, you know, kind of what can we put energy behind and what can, what can people sort of be doing? And I think mm -hmm. that's, that is helpful. I think that, you know, people want to feel right now, like there's something to do and wait, you know, ways that they can act. One of the things I'm always sort of struck by when we talk about, you know, police violence is that people feel there's there's the hopelessness that comes with it that I think is understandable, but then there's a, a piece of hopelessness that I've never quite been able to, to square because there's this sense of, well, what can we do? There's, there's only so much that can be done. Mm -hmm. but the thing is that a system that works like this, this was, this was policy that makes it possible for, you know, police officers to act um, in, in dangerous ways and not be held accountable. So there are policy solutions to it. So mm -hmm. that is, I think that, I think that's just, it, sometimes there's kind of a disconnect. I feel, feel like people aren't as conscious of that as they should be. And so I'm really heartened by all of the work that people are doing right now to point to right. policy solutions that are about, you know, what can, what can happen, you know, national use of force standards requiring cops to deescalate before any kind of fatal force is used. Some of these things that will have huge, huge impacts on mm -hmm. You know, these situations sort of moving forward. So I think that this, that we do have a moment sort of from the, from just a political standpoint to, you know, this is when we need to be calling electeds, letting people know that this is a priority and making sure that at every level of government, local, state, federal, this is mm -hmm. something that people are prioritizing and we're getting folks in office that are going to, you know, take this issue seriously. Um, you and I are uh, about the same age. So we, uh, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we've we've lived through some history at this point uh yeah. and uh but I, I i'm wondering how you feel about um the the youths right now um and and if that is a source of any encouragement for you right now you know I, i'm i'm always taken by uh young people and you know how people are activating in in these moments of crisis um i'm so excited to see how people are looking at this and and demanding more and you know I think it's it's always a tough thing I think sort of generationally when we're doing movement work or in organizing I think that there's this you know as you as just by nature of how these things work as you get older there are more things that you have lived through you've seen you've seen things work so differently and so there mm -hmm. is you know, you're willing to put up with things that younger people aren't, you know, and I think one thing that I always try to encourage people, it's like, as you become sort of the older people in the movement, try to, you know, sort of have the humility to recognize that the movement is changing. And as you're the younger people in the movement, have the grace to realize that the people who have kind of <laughs> gone through it are, you know, they're, they're, they just had different formative experiences. So right. I think I'm definitely at that point of the movement now where I'm asking for, I'm, I'm asking for the grace and, and, and calling on my humility. But, <laughs> um, but <laughs> But what what is what's I think really cool about that cycle is that it means you get to watch this new generation of people who 
look at this and say, you know, this far and no further, and we are not compromising. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really excited that I'm getting to see this generation take this issue on because Mm -hmm. it, it is one that needs that kind of attention, that kind of demand, that kind of sort of unwillingness to compromise. Right. I'm, I'm seeing that, I'm seeing that a lot. I'm seeing that with the folks that have taken to the streets. And it's weird because there's an urgency to it. And I, and mm-hmm. I really, I, I have a lot of faith in this generation of organizers to, to really make sure that as much as this moment feels different, that this actually can be different this time. So uh, you've worked inside of government a, a lot and, uh and you've seen politics functioning, you've seen government functioning. There are things that are broken about this, but of course I think the, uh, the, the, the response to that can't be like, okay, well, let's abandon it then. Let's continue to hobble it. Let's ignore it. Let's, like it has to be fix it. So how do we fix it? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I think a piece of it is um, it's, it's, it's people, it's people getting involved. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's people getting involved for the right reasons. The people right now who are having this be one of their formative political experiences, they are going to be qualitatively different types of leaders because mm-hmm. th- seeing something like this and, and having that be the thing that sparks, I want to make change. So I think that, you know, folks that, you know, if you are called to want to do something better in a moment of crisis, like go run, do something, get involved, because Mm -hmm. if that's the thing that sparks your interest in making things better, you are one of the people we want making things better. I think beyond that, there are things about our politics that are broken because, because there is... I mean, to put simply, there's a sort of a cost to entry, right? I mean, that it, anytime there is a system where if you have resources, your problems get greater attention. And if you don't have those resources, your problems get deprioritized. Mm-hmm. We are not going to have a system that is best equipped to deal with the issues that impact the most of us because most of us do yeah. not we have those kinds of resources. We have to fix what is, I think, a baseline issue. And that is that our politics are way too consumed by who can get money into mm-hmm. the system and therefore have their issues looked at first. Uh, and there's obviously campaign finance reform solutions kind of everywhere. But I think acknowledging that is mm-hmm. a big part of what we need to do. I also think we have to step away from this idea that, you know, I was what I was kind of saying before that, you know, when we talk about issues like racial justice, that we are talking about sort of issues that only were relevant to communities of color and 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 as a result they can sort of be pushed off to the side. I think that one of the tough things about a moment like this is that we're talking about policing, but we're also talking about a system of white supremacy and we're talking about, you know, sort of just a very fundamental difference in the ways that people interact in the society and how they feel protected by the society and based on race. Mm-hmm. And we have conditioned ourselves to think of that as such a divisive topic that we don't even want to sort of talk about it until we're confronted with something like this. And then we are almost surprised that we are not super good at talking about it. With each other, <laughs> <that> it <laughs> like we give ourselves no practice. And yeah. then biggest things happen and people are awkward around it or people say the wrong thing or people, you know, and, and, and look, there are just some people that uh, obviously there are some people who do not care and are, mm-hmm. are not, worried that they don't know how to, what to say in this moment, but I'm not really thinking about them. I'm more thinking about sure. the folks who genuinely are, see a moment like this, feel the helplessness, you know, white folks who maybe haven't been as conscious of some of this stuff and are having their eyes open, but they kind of don't know where to go and they don't know where to start and they don't want to say the wrong thing. So they don't say anything mm-hmm. and that gets read differently. You know, so I think, I think we've created this really weird quagmire around the way that we approach and talk about race that we only talk about it in moments of crisis when the temperatures are already so high. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the only people that feel 100% comfortable talking about it are people that like study it and write about it and talk about it and people who don't care how they sound talking about it. And so basically it is Mm -hmm. people who are racist or don't care about sounding racist talking to people who make this their career to talk about. And that's our national conversation around race. And so I think some of it is almost mm-hmm. just letting ourselves, challenging ourselves to have the awkward conversations. I think it goes back to this question of grace. I think people can come in good faith um, mm-hmm. and sort of get grace in return. Um, I think that people, I think that some of these conversations can get a lot 
more comfortable and a lot more common. Right. Um, it doesn't mean they're going to get, I mean, it doesn't mean they're not going to be awkward because they are, and they're going to be tough and they're going to be courageous conversations you have to have with people. But I, I do think that we have to approach it as this is, it's a necessity. We can't wait until it's this to engage in it at all. And I'm just, I'm realizing more and more how much that still happens. You know, because it is such an important and big thing in our society, I think it is important to be curious about it, engage with it. Because I, I think that like you can't help if you're not at all informed. And you also can't be like, okay, my, the first step of me helping is to place the burden on someone else right. to help inform me. Right. But like, <laughs> you know, like it, you can't interface with anything if you don't know about it. And so I think that that learning process is really important. It should be a bigger part of our education system, but it should also be a part of what we do as, as like citizens. Like it should be just something right. that, that we feel um, you know, it is part of, you know, not even necessarily just an obligation, but, but something that we should be passionate about. What you just described is, I think, one of the tensions that lies at the core of this. It's, yeah, one it's of them. that there are people who want to, to learn and their immediate thought is, oh, well, I'll just, I'll ask someone because that, you know, we do that with a lot of things in life. So I'll ask someone who seems to know about this. And then immediately that, that right, that, that puts a burden on someone else. Sometimes that is a burden that people are willing to take on. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's not, yeah. there's no magic ingredient mm -hmm. as to when that happens. And so I think a, a safe way to do it is, you know, people always say, well, Google and read. And I think that that's great advice. And I, and I understand why that's people's advice. But mm -hmm. I also appreciate that it's not like this stuff is super accessible. If you genuinely are like, I need to start, you know, some sort of from, from ground zero. I think there are, are books out there that try really, really hard um, to do that. There's a book called, um, so you want to talk about race that I think is incredible and does a really good job, I think, from a let's meet people where they are standpoint. But I don't mm -hmm. think every every book or article about racial justice starts from a standpoint of, I'm going to where you are regardless of your level. Of, there's a disconnect there that I think we have to acknowledge that sometimes we are saying we want people to learn. And that means that there are mm -hmm. going to be people who are curious and don't quite know where to go with that. And so mm -hmm. again, it's, I mean, I think it, I think it varies, but I, I also think that, you know, a big way to handle that is having diverse friend groups because if, you hang with people and have already have emotional ties and a trust level and they know that your intentions are good and you mm -hmm. ask them questions people are going to be more willing to take on that burden they're going to be more willing to give that grace they're going to be more understanding of you didn't get the vocabulary quite right but i knew where you were going mm -hmm. but i think that that it's sort of it, it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing because yeah. it is way too easy for party groups to, to to be segregated, especially yeah. for white folks. And then for people to kind of look around and say, oh well, wait, I don't have anyone I'm close to I can ask about this. Let me ask this random person. And that's when <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's when there's yeah. the there's, so I mean it's 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 tough, but it feels like it's sort of the the answer really does seem to be community. It's closer it's closer connection because we can yeah. do that we're already in community with each other. One, one thing that we do every year here is we have a census that we run and uh, I usually it's analyze it. the census before, yes. Okay, thank you. And I usually analyze it uh, before now, but haven't because uh, things got busy this year. Yeah. We ask a question about race in that census. I think that you were probably aware coming into this conversation that the majority of the the audience would be would be white folk. Uh, so so thinking thinking about that, uh, like and, and sort of like introducing this topic maybe to people who have been really apprehensive about it or like you know really like genuinely are coming at it from a good place but feel like just like very anxious because like it's a yeah. completely understandable thing to be anxious about. You know, one thing that that like I see is like two bad reactions to the concept of privilege. One is like, I definitely don't have privilege. I have all these hard things in my life. And so that's fake. Um, and the second is like, I have privilege. I feel guilty about it. And I will then move through my life with guilt, but no like positive anything on the other side of that. It's sort of like, like, oh, so I've been given this negative emotion and I will just carry it around and then do all my normal things. I am very resistant to the idea that, that uh, what you have is something to feel ashamed of because I just, th I like think that we're all sort of like in the situation that we're in. 
But I heard Baratunde Thurston say this week in a podcast that um, it's not like everybody go, like goes around and says to Superman, like, stop using your power. They say, use your power for good stuff. Right. And, uh, and so that, that really resonates with me that this is about what you have and what you have isn't about how you should feel about what you have. It's about what you should do with what you have. Right. Um, so with that in mind, what should we do with what we have? I really, I love that framing. Um, but, and I think you're right. I mean, there is, there is like a knee jerk when you recognize you have sure. privilege, like a yeah. sense of like, the, right. It's like, you feel bad. You feel like, well, then, but. And, and I think it's really important to work through that because you're right. I think that the other side of that is if I feel guilty about something, I want to hide it. I don't want mm -hmm. to. Or be angry or lash out or like shame is a terrible emotion that no one wants to feel. Yeah. Absolutely. And so working through it and acknowledging it and saying it out loud. And I think that that's important, you know, it just it, sort of in and of itself, because I think you're right, just having that shame, it's such a, that is, it's so destructive, but then, right, there are so many things that come from that. The, the recognition of white privilege in these conversations means that there are conversations that would be easier for you to have than for me to have. Mm -hmm. um, no matter how many times, like I, I talk about race a lot, I write about race a lot, I tend to be a pretty effusive, friendly person. I try really hard to say, I'm still me when I'm talking about race, but it, inevitably, as soon as I start talking about race, there is, there's more defensiveness that I feel than mm -hmm. if I were just like talking about, you know, something fun and like, yeah. or something that people just want to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It, it happens no matter, and, and there's, and, and I feel like I've gotten to a point where there's no amount of like, I want to be super accessible about it that is going to completely relieve that because as soon as it's coming from me, mm -hmm. there is an assumption of, okay, I've got to say the right thing and I don't know as much, so I can't say anything and, I, all, and, and everything else that comes along with that. Because of that, I pay a bigger penalty for bringing that kind of stuff up. One of the things that white privilege is incredibly useful at doing is is help, helping to talk about some of the issues that people of color can't bring up. And so being the one to talk about this, taking a platform that you have and elevating work that's being done and, and voices and stories that wouldn't otherwise get that platform, acknowledging that there are ways that there are ways that privilege contributed to an ability to build a platform and therefore will bring the next folks up. That kind of stuff is so valuable and it's so important. And it's only gonna come if people feel comfortable saying, Yes, I, I have had privilege. It is, it, that has helped me. I am going to make sure that I use that and help other people. I mean, I think it's a lot, there's a lot tied up with it, but that this idea that if you acknowledge privilege, it means you're somehow undermining yourself. You haven't worked hard. You haven't, <laughs> that it's like, it's either or, that it's like mm -hmm. you did it 1000% by yourself or privilege is the only reason you are here versus yeah. here. And getting to, please, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you had the thought on that. My thought was that uh, you're saying like, if, if you're recognizing your priv privilege that you're, you're somehow hurting yourself, you're saying like, okay, I have privilege and so I'm gonna start succeeding less or something. Um, and, right. and like, that, I, I see people who, th who think that. Um, and, but like, to, to me, it's like, helping people is the best part of being successful. It's like right. being able to like, like meet people who are amazing and be like, uh, people should pay attention to this great person. And it's also like, it's well known psychologically that helping other people makes you happier than helping yourself. And so it's like, like, why wouldn't we do it? Like we, like, of course our brains don't think that, but like, right. that's how we react. You know, it's, it, there's this fairly famous study that like, if you give somebody um, 50 bucks and you say, spend it on yourself, at, or you say, spend it on someone else, that at the end of the day, like they would all prefer to spend it on themselves, but at the end of the day, they're happier when they spend it on someone else. Right. And, um, right. and so like being, being mindful and aware of that and, and, like, ha and also like having had that experience a number of times, I, kn I know it is true, um, even if it doesn't right. feel intuitive all the time. So, right. so to me, it's like, oh, like this is so wonderful that like I have an opportunity to use a power that I have. Because right. That's really what privilege is, is it's power. You know, sh should be thinking more about that, how to use that because like it makes me happier and it makes the world better. And like, those are the two things I want. <laughs> 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 they're just that easy and clear. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, it's, it's it's true. And I also think, I mean, you know, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that people who don't have privilege in some ways have privilege in other places, right? Like, yeah. I have an awful lot of privilege as a straight cis person, right? Like I, that, that is that, and, and we have the sense of you're either privileged or you're not like they're, mm-hmm. it's, it's binary. Right. And so in different settings, I'm the one who can say, wait a minute, there's something I can bring up here that like my queer friends couldn't, or I, I can be the one to call out ableism because as an able-bodied person, it's easier for me. Right. So mm-hmm. I think that that acknowledging that around race conversations, yes, I, I'm going to re- rely a lot more on my friends, who, my white friends who want to act in allyship and, and bring this stuff up when I can. But there are going to be rooms where I absolutely have that ability to do it. And so I also think that helps us sometimes because, again, if you conceptualize it as you have it or you don't, that makes it way too easy to buy into this model mm-hmm. of somehow it makes me less than or you know Mm -hmm. that it's it really is situational and like i think it's important that we talk about it that way my last question here for you is uh what's making you hopeful right now i will say again you know watching the young people who are are leading this fight um Mm. is is incredibly incredibly inspiring um it makes me feel like you know there are people who are seeing this and are having that spark awakened in them and so Mm -hmm. you know you know, this becomes sort of the issue that our movement is taking up, that leaders are taking up. Like, I, I think that that's, that is going to be huge. I am seeing more of these conversations. You know, I've gotten a lot of people who've reached out to me um, in, you know, in these moments who I, you know, these are our friends that I have, I have strong relationships with who have texted and done that, you know, I want to check in, how are you feeling, but have gone further than that and said, you know, I'm raising kids and I don't know how I should be talking about this, but I know that I, I haven't talked to my white kids about this. And I know mm-hmm. that peers who have black kids are already having to have these conversations. So right. what should, you know, what do you think? What should I be doing? What should I be saying? And I'm, I'm so grateful that it's like, okay, people, I mean, people want to do this. I, mm-hmm. I think that there is, there's so much power in just being willing to say, huh, I hadn't thought about that before. And like, there's, again, there's vulnerability there because there's the obvious part of like, well, how lucky am I that I never had to think about it? And you could get stuck in that, but instead people are actually reaching out and trying to do something different. I'm seeing a lot more of the Facebook posts where people, and and my absolute, absolute favorite thing is for people when they say like, hey, listen, if, if you're having this moment right now and you're hearing people say Black Lives Matter and you think to yourself, well, all lives matter, DM me. One of the, I think, hardest things wow, about social wow. media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. It, it's, it's, and it's so critical because here's the thing you get on social media and you're like, if you're thinking this, unfollow me. If you're thinking this, I'm going to say, you know, you're going to get a lot more likes and engagement. And there's mm-hmm. something really satisfying about just unfollowing the family member who always says the wrong thing or who, you know, like there's, you get satisfaction from that Mm -hmm. and you get external validation from it. But the actual helpful conversation is one that you can only have in DM because Mm -hmm. it's the conversation where you say, you know what, actually, I used to think this, or Mm -hmm. I've actually had, like, I've had moments like this and you make yourself vulnerable. So this person makes themselves vulnerable back and you can actually get to somebody in a way you couldn't if you yeah, nobody's yeah. changing their mind based on an argument on someone's timeline on Facebook. Right. Publicly, are, performatively, so that everybody's looking right. at it and you can't show right. any weakness. Yeah. Exactly. That's, it's and right. Yeah. It undermines every single thing that would be valuable about this conversation. You can't admit, huh, I hadn't considered that. Like you can't mm-hmm. do that. But you can over DM, you can over phone calls. And so that I think is so much of what we say when 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 there's a sense of like go get your people. Like the, the goal there is not go excoriate on social media your people. The idea is you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I think, look, again, I, do, I, it's, it, I get it, even from a standpoint that has nothing to do with external validation. It feels good to have somebody say something awful and you to slam the door in their face. There's something mm-hmm. satisfying about that, but it's not helpful. And I think that's one of the tough things to remember about being an ally is that on some level, it sucks. Like, it's not supposed to be easy. It's doing a lot of the hard work. It feels good because you know you're doing the right thing, not because in a moment it's satisfying. It, 
you're actually supposed to do the stuff that makes you a little uncomfortable and that gives an inch and lets that person come in enough mm -hmm. and then say, look, I get it. And here's how I got here. Because yeah. that's the conversation that stays with them. And yeah. so I'm really, I've been really, really excited every time I see that kind of stuff. Because I know that the real work has to happen behind the closed doors and it doesn't get the likes and it doesn't get the retweets, but it actually might be the thing that stops someone from saying it the next time or that has someone think twice the next time they're in a situation. Well, uh, this has been a really wonderful conversation. I appreciate you doing it. Also, thanks for chatting with me offline a bit this morning. Um, so it's great to talk with you. Uh, what was your first Vlogbrothers video? I saw the Harry Potter oh, song. Deathly Hallows? So wow. Yes. Wow. So yes. you've, been, you've been a nerd the whole time. I see what's I up. really have been. So it was so <laughs> funny too, because I remember I saw it because it was, it was, it was featured on YouTube's yeah. like homepage. I was not like a YouTuber. I did not know about this whole community. I saw this. I was well, like, oh, it was 2007. Is... No one did. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> because we're going to now pretend like I definitely know so much about it. <laughs> <laughs> now but you're I, really in. Now I'm like, I don't deep it. <laughs> no, but I, I remember it. It was there and I like send it to my sister. And then I just saw that like you guys were doing this thing and I have a sister I'm very close to. And so I'm always really excited when siblings are doing stuff together. <laughs> but I remember just going back and just, I was so, and have remained. And this is very genuinely true. I have remained so impressed by this community that has been built because so much of, I think what we were just talking about is people seeking out community and trying to have some grace and trying to have some humility is not always that doesn't always have a very natural home online. Mm -hmm. um, and I really, I really saw it here. You know, like I, I don't myself sort of make videos or anything, but I remember there was a period of time where people would make their own videos and share them. And I felt this very, like you all had cultivated and brought together a group of people who genuinely seemed to want to just do good things together. And I've loved that. I loved the idea of the projects and like, there's a charity now because people, you know what I mean? Like I, that. Yeah. So I, I was, I've just been so consistently warmed by that and have always just been a big fan. So yeah. I'm so grateful that you, that you reach out and I'm so happy to have had this conversation. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm so grateful that you're doing all of the work you're doing. I'm grateful you're a part of this community, but uh, also other communities and all the stuff you're doing to help, uh, to help make the world a bit of a better place. Um, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter. I'm, um, uh, my oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Maya Rupert on Twitter. I think I'm the same on Facebook. So I, you're not on. Had, so you're not on TikTok yet. I, I had interns teach me TikTok. Uh, I did. Okay. Like, I wish we had saved the outtakes because it was me just consistently not understanding the vehicle <laughs> at all. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah, this is, yeah. I, I feel like my, my social media is limited, but I yeah. often end, yeah, on Twitter. Well, thank you so much, Maya. John, I'll see you on Tuesday. If you want to check out So You Want to Talk About Race, the book she was talking about, that's linked in the description. Also, 8cantwait.org, the number 8 can'twait.org. It's a fantastic resource, makes it easy to understand how to start or continue work in advocacy, trying to get some things changed.